What is up and I welcome each and every one of you back to a brand new video. I hope you're all having fantastic days and if not, I hope I can make your day just a little bit better. Before we get started, like, comment, subscribe. Did I tell you guys to subscribe? Because that is something you should definitely be doing. We are back and we are doing Firaxis's job. Yes, as you all may know, later on in April, there's going to be this massive update that is going to tweak at least two-thirds of every Civ on the roster. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to make a video about that, doing that stuff myself so I can save Firaxis's time and they can completely copy my ideas and just implement it into the game because as we all know, I am right and everybody else is wrong. In all honesty though, I thought it would be a great idea to just look through all the sieves I had in my tier list, which will be up on the screen right now. Don't take this as an actual tier list. What I wanted to do is have all the sieves hover around the C and B tier. So, for example, um, Hungary, in my opinion, is an A tier sieve, but I feel like that their bonuses aren't anything too crazy. So, I have them in the B tier as a way to show that I'm not going to be editing their bonuses, if that makes sense. I want to nerf all the sieves in the S and A tier, and I want to buff all the sieves from the F, E, and D tier. And without further ado, let's get started with the worst civilization in the game, in my opinion, Eleanor of Aquitaine, the English version. Now, what do I think would help the English version? Museums holding double the great works. That was England's old ability, I think, before the Gathering Storm patch. And I think if they brought it back just for Eleanor, that would make her abilities much better. Not only that, but I think they should also give a production boost to archaeologists for Eleanor. And artists and museums are... Er, mu archaeologic museums and art museums are automatically themed. I feel like if they do that, you would get more great works to make use of your Court of Love unique ability, and you would also have a nice bonus to a culture victory, which is what Eleanor seems to be good at, except that England's other abilities just had nothing to do with culture. So I think just giving her the old English ability, where archaeologic museums give six great work slots instead of the normal three, as well as a production boost to archaeologists, and museums in general are automatically themed, gives Eleanor just this sort of culture type of victory. And so we get, just so everybody knows the rules on this, I am not allowed to completely change a civilization, right? Like, for example, if I have Cyrus here, I can't automatically change all his abilities to go towards, like, a science victory or something crazy like that. I have to stay within the theme that Fraxis identified for each civilization, and I also can't, you know, I can't, um... It's, it's pretty much it. I have to stay within the theme and, like, edit them based on the current theme. Like, I can't remove the Immortals for Persia because they're so big to their abilities. And I can't change Eleanor's unique ability because that is, like, the major draw, I guess, of Eleanor, if that makes any sense. I can only do small tweaks here and there and just buff or nerf already existing abilities, if that makes sense. I can only add abilities when it seems like... For example, Eleanor has no bonuses towards culture, and I think just adding in museums and extra great work slots would help towards your central theme of reducing loyalty of enemy civilizations, if that makes any sense. Next up on our list, we have Tamar of Georgia. Yes, we all make jokes about how bad Tamar is, but I feel like her base idea is a good one. I feel like, first things first, her unique unit replaces the swordsman, all right? Having it as the sort of just original unit that you have to hard build or buy just completely eliminates it from viability having it upgrade from a swordsman you know it could be in the same upgrade class right it could be in the same tech tree it could be in the civil service tech tree along with pikemen but having it upgrade from swordsman will allow you to build an army and make use of it much faster the other thing is give her great profit points for each holy site. Just give her one great profit point for each holy site. Just give her the ability to found a religion. This has been the worst thing about Tamar. Come on, just give her the ability to get a religion. Plus one great profit point makes things a hell of a lot easier. And have it so she can buy walls with faith. Her walls are an integral part of her identity, but having to build ancient and medieval era walls just to get access to these renaissance walls that really aren't like anything incredible, have it so she can buy the walls with faith, right? Just so she can spend more time producing things she needs instead of just building walls which are going to be absolutely useless half the time. And have it so that she seems like she wants to go towards a tourism victory using her faith. I think the best way to do that is in a golden age... 50% of her faith is converted to culture, and that culture is converted to tourism after getting flight. And you also get 5% tourism 
for each city-state you are suzerain of. I feel like this allows her to make use of her good faith production and her sort of leaning in towards getting envoys to city-states and getting suzerainty of city-states. Have it so that in a golden age, every suzerain you have and every bit of faith you have is converted to culture and eventually tourism. That would make it so that she is a much better civ when it comes to tourism, and she has sort of this central identity, instead of having, you know, one ability to boost faith, another to boost tourism, and another to boost uh, diplomacy. I feel like just integrating all of those into one central ability focused on a culture victory will help her out as a civilization in general. Okay, next up we have the E-tier civilizations. These civilizations aren't trash, they're not exactly good, but they're not bad. They're subpar, I guess you could say. So they're just minor bonuses, I guess, pretty much. First off, we have uh, Cleopatra. Egypt, you gain one trade route slot for each wonder. You specialize in building wonders. Why not give one trade route slot that you can use to trade and get even more gold due to your Mediterranean's broad unique ability for each wonder. It's nothing too crazy, maybe like four or five extra trade routes by the time the Renaissance era comes around, but it is definitely something that would help you tremendously with your unique ability. Also have it that tra other civs trade routes to you provide two gold and two culture instead of like just gold because providing two food for enemy civilizations it's a terrible trade you know you get gold and they get food it's just absolutely horrific the difference between a domestic trade route and an international trade route is domestic trade route provides you with food and production the international one gives you gold you know having it so that enemy civs get food from your trade routes at the very least give yourself culture so that when people trade with you you're at the very least getting a bonus that will help you towards your specified victory type and also have it so that floodplains provide one food in general like floodplains in general provide one food so that you will have more population to work sphinx tiles and so that it sort of creates a dynamic where okay do i want to build a wonder and theater square here or do i want to build farms and get massive amounts of food you know have it have, have a little depth to Cleopatra's gameplay, and also have like a nice small plus one food bonus early on, no matter what you choose. I feel like these tiny bonuses would make Cleopatra a much, much better sieve. Next up, we have Philip of Spain. Yes, Philip, he, he's pretty much the dollar store version of Basil, and just the dollar store version of Portugal as well, if we're being completely honest. The way I'd fix him is, cities on other continents give you double the loyalty. He has good bonuses, you know, like the mission is really good on other continents, but the problem is, on other continents, uh, there isn't any guarantee you will start between two continents, which is the only time Philip can be good, in my opinion. You know, if you're starting, like, firmly in one continent and the other continent is, like, 20 tiles away and you're an enemy civilization, you're kind of boned. So have it so that other continents get completely full loyalty, 100% loyalty, and they also provide 50% more gold than usual, so that it also plays into Spain's unique ability, Treasure Fleet, that gives you extra gold and extra resources from having cities on other continents, and it will also make other cities on other continents much easier to maintain, and also just give like four combat strength on other continents for all of your units, and instead of having four combat strength for other religions what is it have a bonus of four combat strength against players following other religions just have it plus four combat strength on get on other continents essentially sort of how like the french uh, unique unit does it but have it with all of philip's unique units all of philip's units in general so like make philip exclusively good when going towards other continents instead of having this sort of uh, just half like you know faith and kind of you know, have the Conquistador and have, like, the missionaries give plus 10 combat strength. That is good. You know, have a little bit of religion tied into it along with the mission. But have it mainly, like, the Spanish Empire in real life. Incredible bonuses on other continents. And just, you know, have it, like, make it easier to get cities on other continents. That is what I think they should do for Philip. Next up, we have the Cree Pound Maker. So what would I do for Pound Maker? Number one. Uh, the trade routes that give food and gold for each camp or pasture, replace that and have it for each resource instead, right? Have it so that you get one food and one gold for each, you know, specific resource. I feel like that is more reliable instead of having camps or pastures, so that you will almost definitely get three or four food and gold for each trade route in each city. That would make it so that 
trade routes of Poundmaker will be absolutely, at the very least, very, very good. You know, I am sort of, you know, you might think that this is like too good of an ability, right? Every resource might be a massive amount of food and gold. But I mean, look at Portugal, right? <laughs> look at what they did to Portugal. If they're going to do that to Portugal, uh, the things I'm doing to Poundmaker are just fine. And also, give it so that the unique the unique improvement, the Mekewap, gives you one extra food as a base. Yeah, just, to, just to help things grow in, in general, right? One food, one production, and one housing as a base. And then have these extra bonuses stack on the later you get on towards the next era. And replace the unique unit. Instead of having it as a scout, have it as a warrior. Come on, have it as a warrior. And give it one extra sight so it still has the scouting capabilities, right? Extra sight on the warrior. But the fact that it's on a scout is kind of wasted. Have it on a warrior, you know, replace the warrior unique unit. So that number one, you get this unit immediately when you start the game. And number two, you can hard build as many of these as possible. Go to war early on and potentially even upgrade them into swordsmen. And keep the plus one free promotion so that you will have very strong swordsmen. It just sort of gives a nice little boost to Poundmaker as well as the other abilities. So that is my abilities for Poundmaker. Next up, we have Victoria. That is right. What would I do with Victoria? Cities on other continents provide a 10% boost to food, no, to gold, science, and culture for each unique resource not found on the original continent. You know, I want this ability. It sort of like makes sense due to the British Empire in real life. You know, having uh, cities on other continents to provide resources that are not found on the original continent is just sort of like a central part of why the British Empire came around. Having like, like this in the game, you know, maybe like... Uh, in the other continent, cities on other continents, you know, maybe you have like two luxury resources and a bonus resource not found on your original continent nearby, gives you a 30% boost to gold, science, and culture, empire-centric yields instead of like food and production. Uh, this would make England much, much stronger, and it would also have it so that they are more incentivized to go towards other continents. Uh, they already are incentivized, but I just feel like having these abilities would make England a lot better, and it would just make them sort of catch up to the new frontier pass and gathering storm civilizations. The other thing is, give naval units plus four combat strength in general. England controls the seas. Uh, plus four combat strength really isn't all that much, but it is a slight boost, and also sort of makes sense based on, I guess, the lore of the British Empire, if you want to call it that. So that's what I'm doing for England. Next up, we have Latoro of uh, the Mapuche. Yes, so uh, the Mapuche sort of all around, you know, it gets bon unit bonuses towards pillaging other tiles. Then it has unit bonuses to combat strength and experience. Then it has, like, we're going to make this a sort of culture-centric sieve, but keeping the bonuses towards pillaging and units and stuff like that. So first things first, remove the breathtaking appeal from your unique tile improvement, and instead it gets 100% culture due to the tile's appeal instead of 75%. Appeal really isn't all that much. It's going to be usually like two to three, like most of the time, and breathtaking is only going to provide you like four culture, and so it's not anything like tremendous you know, maybe have it so that you can't build them adjacent to each other, but you know, I don't think that's necessary. And also have it so that, you know, keep the tourism bonus after researching flight, obviously. Uh, replace the loyalty bonuses you get from Swift Hawk with culture bonuses. So what I mean, when you defeat a unit within the borders of the enemy city, instead of losing 20 loyalty, it provides a certain amount of culture. Pillaging enemy tiles provides a certain amount of culture. This is much better because the loyalty one is kind of stupid, though. You would have to complete... Like, let's say you get uh, an absolutely golden opportunity. You kill five enemy units within the enemy borders, which almost never happens, but let's humor us for a second. You know, okay, the city rebels. It turns into a free city. It's going to go back in, like, three or five turns in general. You know what I mean? So it's kind of a useless ability. Um, and I feel like having it... So that you're pillaging and killing enemy units to reduce loyalty is kind of a dumb mechanic in general. Because I know it's, they wanted it to sort of mirror the rise and fall, you know, adding loyalty into rise and fall, have a civilization that does things with loyalty. Uh, I find that it's absolutely useless. Replace that with culture. And so we can have the Mapuche as sort of a militaristic civilization 
but instead of conquering city-states, they pillage everything, and they get a massive amount of culture that can be used to help them towards a culture victory, which also sort of makes the unique improvement a much better unique improvement in general. That is what I have for Ku for the Mapuche. Next up, we have China. We have uh, Qin Shi Huang. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, the problem with China is that if you're just focusing on building wonders and builders early on, you are just inviting enemy civilizations to go to war with you, especially on the higher difficulties. So it's something simple. We'll make things a little bit easier because I feel like all their abilities are very nice and very good, you know, good and balanced. You know what I mean? Nothing too crazy, but things that will, that are definitely effective. Uh, have it so that builders are 50% cheaper and instead of, uh, completing 15% of the original culture cost... Have it so that they complete 20% of the original culture cost, right? Building builders cheaper means you'll have more room to either build more builders if you want, or to build a sort of military to defend against enemy civilizations, and the 20% charge towards building uh, wonders. It's just, it's just a tiny little bonus that I feel like would make China up to par with all the other civilizations that are really good. And that is everything I have for China. Nothing too crazy, but something that would definitely help. Next up... We have Gorgo. Yes, Gorgo of Greece. What are we going to do with Gorgo? First things first, we're going to do something for all of Greece, including Pericles. Hoplites do not get a debuff against melee class units. The Hoplite is probably the worst unique unit in the game because you build the Hoplite, you know, get that 10% combat strength bonus. Bonus, you know, you're going to have 35 combat strength. Uh, you still struggle against warriors because you're only going to have 25 combat strength. And if warriors have oligarchy and they are on deity, they will actually be stronger than you even if you have an adjacent hoplite, which is just stupid. Come on now. Remove the debuff for melee units just for hoplites. You know, make them a lot better. And not only that, but have it so Gorgo gains 100% of the culture from kills. You know, have it so that Gorgo blows her load extremely early on. Like, have her one of the best early game civilizations. You will have a 35 combat strength hoplite before other civilizations get horsemen and swordsmen. And have it so that you get... Uh, 100% of the culture from combat strength so that you can immediately beeline through the civic tree. Just get a nice massive early boost on culture and have it so that your later bonuses are pretty much non-existent, but have it so that your early bonuses, if played correctly, can easily uh, carry your way through the entire game, right? Build a mass, just kind of like Gilgamesh in a way. Just have a nice early, massive early bonuses and just later you go on, you have less bonuses but the early bonuses you got will help make up for those later bonuses. You know, have it so that you need skill, but also if you do it right, you can easily win a game 100%, even on Deity. Uh, next up, we have Wilfred Laurier of Canada. Uh, the only thing I have for him is each improved Tundra Tile provides one culture converted to tourism later, and Snow Tiles provide one food and one production. Have it so that he wants to settle uh, Snow Tiles and Tundra Tiles almost exclusively, and building farms on snow, tundra, and tundra snow tiles uh, give him a massive amount of culture, which will help him even more towards a tourism victory. It just makes him that much better. And being able to settle snow tiles, uh, sort of what Canada pretty much did uh, in real life. And also, you know, it's a nice little bonus, bonus to have. Bonus. <laughs> you almost sound Canadian right there. <laughs> in any case, that's what I'm doing for Canada. Next up, we have Gandhi. Yes, Gandhi, I do have a little bit of a different mechanic for him. Just hear me out. <clears throat> Instead of gaining the follower belief on Gandhi, you gain the founder belief for each of your cities that have a majority religion. So what I mean by that is... Uh, no, no, that's not what I mean. No, that was my old idea. My new idea is just... Number one, you gain 10 great profit points for each civilization you meet. So what that means is, if you meet all the civilizations in the small game, you will only need 10 great profit points to get to to get a great profit. So I have it so Gandhi has an incredibly... Um, it's a good ability, but something that you have to take initiative in. You know, find other civilizations, get the great profit points, and if you do everything right, you will have the first religion in the game. But if you decide not to explore, you don't... It, it, it's just a useless ability, pretty much. Found other civilizations, get great profit points, get an early great uh, profit, and after that, have it so that you gain the founder belief 
for each follower inside of a religion instead of the follower belief you gain a founder belief now that might seem absolutely insanely broken i know but as of right now really india does not have anything gearing towards a specific victory type they do get some faith but i mean you do want enemy religions in your borders and the follower bonus is nice but having like a founder bonus like you know maybe you could have work ethic and world church for each religion have it so that it has to be a certain level you know have it so that it has to be 20 percent of your total religions uh if it is like hinduism for example cracks the 20 percent mark you get the founder belief you know so you could have three to four founder beliefs if you juggle things just right but ha like if you're going for a religion victory due to the 10 great profit points i just mentioned early on have it so that you have to be careful, like a sort of balancing act, like if you spread an enemy religion too much, then you will give the enemies one of your cities religion-wise, and that, you know, have it a balancing act, but if you do things right, you will be an incredible religious sieve. That is what I have for Gandhi, 10 great profit points for each city founded, sort of like Portugal's ability, and you gain the founder belief when a religion uh, converts a certain amount of your population. That's what I have for Gandhi. Next up, we have Christina, H-I-J-K, there she is. Now, what am I doing with Christina? You gain four culture and tourism instead of the two culture and tourism when doing the open air museums, you know, you can only build one per city. So have it so that it is just a little bit better because you're only going to really be settling on plains and grasslands most of the time, maybe desert tiles. So having four to six culture and tourism really isn't all that much. Bump those numbers up to 12 to 16 and then you're talking about a very good ability. Other than that, you also gain great writer, artist, and musician points for each theater square in the Nobel Prize ability. Although, you know you, you know how Sweden gains one great engineer and great scientist from each factory and each university. Have it so that she gains extra great people points for amphitheaters, great, uh, uh, what are they called again, museums, and broadcast centers. Just, you know, Nobel, have it for every single thing. You know, even add great merchant points in there if you want to for each bank. Um, I feel like just adding a little bit to Nobel Prize and giving her the Open Air Museum extra bonuses would make her a little bit better of a sieve. She's already a solid sieve. Just these sieves, would, these abilities would make her in the B and C tier like I discussed earlier on. After that, we have Kublai Khan. This one is extremely simple. Uh, simple, sorry. Um, instead of having one Eureka and one Inspiration for trading posts, this works in enemy civilizations once. So if I go to two Roman cities and I get two trading posts, I only get one Eureka and Inspiration. Remove that and have it so that it is for each city. So if I go to like five Roman cities, five different Roman cities, I get the trading post, I get five Eurekas and five Inspirations. That just makes things a lot better. It also makes China Kublai Khan a little bit better because they get uh, Eureka and Inspiration bonuses. And for Mongolia Kublai Khan, it really doesn't change anything. I feel like Kublai Khan's abilities really don't help out Mongolia's conquest-centric focuses. Uh, so it, it's fine that we don't change that, but China Kublai Khan is going to become much stronger, and it would justify replacing Kublai Khan with uh, Chin Chi Huang, and I feel like that ability is just just a nice little boost, makes it much better, and uh, yeah. After that, we have uh, Jay of Armin. Yes, we have Jay of Armin. Jay of Armin's is easy. Uh, he does seem like, looking at his Prasat unique building, you gain relics if missionaries die in unique combat and missionaries receive the martyr ability. Uh, go all in on tourism. Have it so that aqueducts provide tourism because you like building aqueducts. And holy sites provide, beside rivers, provide tourism once you get flight. Just, you know, make it so that he goes for a nice faith tourism type of victory type and give him extra bonuses towards tourism with your religion it's just a simple ability quality of life makes things a little better after that we have dido yes dido for her abilities i have kothans give trade routes instead of lighthouses so when you build the kothan you immediately get the trade route instead of having to build lighthouses afterwards and settled cities gain extra population and I feel like that just makes, that sort of like makes sense with Carthage and Phoenicia historically. And also nothing too game breaking, but something that could be very, very nice, especially early on and extra population is big. And you also get gold for each improved sea resources, whether that is one or two. Uh, you have to improve the resources, but getting a little bit of extra gold uh, makes Carthage, it sort of helps Carthage in general. You know, you get more gold, you gain more cities, 
Uh, it's it just small quality of life changes that makes Carthage a little bit better and uh, keeps pace with the Gathering Storm sieves as well as the New Frontier Pass sieves. After that, we have Guitarja. Where is she at? Uh, Guitarja, yes. Guitarja is another easy one. Naval units purchased with Faith gain one promotion. Nice little boost, as well as Jong's her unique uh, unit. Just a little bit cheaper to purchase. Whether it be like 20% or 50%, uh, it's up to you to decide. I feel like just having cheaper frigates is the right way to go. Right, have it so that her unique uh, unit is just that much better. Uh, that's pretty much all I have for her. Next up, we have Harold Hardrada. His units are his abilities are very good. The only thing is, make the Berserker better. Come on now, Berserkers now get like make it so that they have five combat strength when attacking, and no com no combat penalty when defending. Uh, the five combat penalty when defending is crippling, man. Like, uh, you could kill them with archers. You could kill these later era units with archers and have it so that they upgrade from swordsmen. I mean, come on. I don't know if they do upgrade with swordsmen. It doesn't say anything on this list. Although, from what I know, they are not upgraded from swordsmen. Just have them upgraded with swordsmen so that I can upgrade swordsmen to berserkers. You know... Attack enemy civilizations, get a nice 5 combat bonus when attacking. You know, have it so that you have 3 movement speed when you start an enemy territory, but pillaging now only costs 1 movement. You know, just to sort of help the Thunderbolt of the North sort of centric playstyle that Harold Hadrada has. Small, small changes to the Berserker class makes things a lot better. I like the Viking Longship, I like his unique ability. Thunderbolt of the North is probably the best name for a civilization ability. Stave Church is nice, but nothing too crazy. And the Kinar, I think it's pronounced Nar, is also a very nice addition to have. Just make Berserkers just a tiny bit better, and I feel like we have a really good civilization. Finally, for the civs we are going to nerf, we have Jadwiga, or buff, sorry. We have Jadwiga of Poland. Uh, she gets massive bonuses to relics, so just give all apostles the martyr promotion and have it so that her unique market replacement provides faith for trade routes passing through the city. You know, just some small quality of life improvements that help her with her relic central, relic central, um, bonus. Her relics are used to get extra faith to help with a faith victory more than anything, and having the unique market provide faith for trade routes, just makes things, you know, a little bit more faith. Jadwiga's already a solid civilization. Doing this will make her a lot better when it comes to religion. And that's pretty much all the civs we have for getting nerfed. Now let's go to civs that we have getting, or nerfed. We just did the ones that are getting buffed, now we're gonna do the ones getting nerfed. All right, it's already been 27 minutes. The good news is, though, there aren't a lot of civs that I have in the SNA tier, so we're just gonna go through them all real quick. Number one, we have Hammurabi. The only thing I'm doing, the Palgum provides food for each farm instead of for each river tile. That is absolutely insane. And just move the have it so it's each farm instead of each river tile. So at least you have to get builders and actually do something to get the food. Is it just stupid having it? Palgums provide food to each river tile. Come on now. And have it so that when you get the Eureka, it only gives you the tech when you are one era behind. So for example, if you're in the classical era, you can only get Eurekas to medieval era techs. If you're in the medieval era, you get the Eureka, but it doesn't unlock the technology until you get to one era behind. Having bombards in the ancient era is absolutely stupid and needs to be nerfed tremendously. This still gives Babylon a sort of identity as being one era ahead, but it sort of limits them just to one era ahead instead of getting like factories in the classical era. Uh, and just to make up for that nerf, have it so that you only get a 20% science penalty instead of 50%. These bonuses make Babylon a lot weaker, but at the same time keep their central identity of just getting technologies very far ahead and, you know, using it to better your civilization, whether it be in a domination or a science victory. After that, we have Grand Columbia, who already did get nerfed, but I feel like one more nerf would just make them nice and balanced. The only nerf is Haciendas no longer provide gold. Uh, just a small one. I was going to do production, but I thought that gold would be just better so that they produce less units and that the production would help them towards other victory types. And Commandante Generals get back the movement speed bonus they had, and they also provide 15 combat strength but you're not allowed to earn great generals as Grand Columbia. That's that's something I think is fair. You know, have Commandante generals as unique great generals and have it so that you don't get great generals, but Commandante generals are just a little bit better. And Haciendas provide less gold because they are one of the best unique improvements in the entire game. 
That's all I have for Grand Columbia. Next up, we have Tamiris of Scythia. This one's simple. Instead of healing 30 hit points, only heal 15. Like, 15 is still a good amount. Healing 30 is absolutely insane. Come, It's like fortifying healing inside of a city for two turns. It's, it's, it's just stupid. Why is this in the game? Have it 15. Cut that in half. After that, horse archers have two extra range to make up for the uh, heal debuff we had. And instead, light cavalry units require 30 horses instead of 20 horses so that you're still building two at a time and they are still cheaper horses wise but you have to get more horses to build these if that may have 30 horses instead of 20 horses just balance the city out a lot more you're building less units and instead of just having 50 horse archers just waiting around you will instead have like 30 or something just a little bit of quality of life changes next up we have Macedon. oh my god it pains me to do this they are my favorite civilization in the entire game uh buffing or nerfing them have it so that the unique building only provides 10 percent of the unit's cost to science but instead, units built gain one extra movement speed. You know, like Macedon conquered the world in real life. Uh, getting extra movement speed would give them that sort of identity of just going from like conquering a massive continent. And just nerfing the, Basil the Basilicoi Pides unique building science boost will have it so that as Macedon, you are sacrificing something for going to war 24-7 instead of being like two techs, two arrows ahead on the tech tree, as well as 50 cities ahead in general. Just, yeah, those bonuses would make Macedon nice and balanced. You know, push them down a little bit, but not too far. Although my bias might be speaking. Next up, we have Portugal. Uh, Portugal is one of the best civs in the entire game. Uh, have it so that you get a 25% yield bonus instead of 50. You know, you still get more trade routes. The 50% bonus is just too massive. Having it at 25%, at the very least, you know, makes it so that they don't get 3,000 gold by the time you're in turn 20 or something. You know, I feel like that's a little bit ridiculous. That's all I have for Portugal. After that, we have the Incas. We have Pacatui. Pachatui. I don't know how to say that name, but the Incas, essentially. I know how to say that. Uh, mountains give one production instead of two. The Incas aren't anything out of this world insanely powerful, but having one production for mountain tiles instead of the base two, just a nice little quality of life bonus. That's all I have for the Incas. After that, we have uh, Germany. Another extremely simple one. Hansas are no longer cheaper to produce. All right, having 20 production for each Hansa is insane. Having them cheaper to build is even more insane. I like having just massive Hansas as Germany. Just make it so that they cost the same as a regular industrial zone. So I can't build these in like three turns. That's just something simple I have for Germany. After that, we have the Ottoman. Surprise, surprise. Another minor debuff instead of just something massive. Um, conquer cities now lose population and they only get two extra loyalty per turn instead of four extra loyalty per turn. So if the Ottomans don't have massive loyalty bonuses in keeping their cities uh just so they have some sort of loyalty thing to work with it's not as much as other civilizations but having a two loyalty bonus is just like cyrus and persia which i feel like is very well balanced and not losing population is just insane it also helps a tremendous amount with loyalty so have it so that they lose a little bit less pop have it so that like they lose 50 percent less population if you want but don't make it like no population lost and have it so that two loyalty instead of four loyalty keep the amenity bonus uh they're going to keep their cities happy but it is no longer something like once you conquer the city halfway across the world when you're in a dark age and the enemy's in a golden age you know maybe have a chance of losing that city to loyalty right after that we have mongolia we have genghis khan's mongolia and i think this also goes for the other mongolia but for Mongolia, no, it's just for Genghis Khan. Remove the plus three combat strength Mongol horde bonus. You know, capturing enemy cavalry, uh, cavalry class units is already insane enough. Uh, getting your double diplomatic visibility bonus combat strength is already good enough. Having the plus three combat strength just for having cavalry, just remove that from the, just remove that from the game. You know, it's not going to affect Mongolia too much, but it does knock them down a peg or two. And then finally, we have Russia. Oh my god, Russia. What are we going to do for Russia? Simple. And I'm sure you cannot disagree with this. Cannot. Lavras no longer provide plus one to each great writer, artist, musician. Instead, they provide a 50% bonus towards theater squares when producing great writers, artists. Have a plus 50% bonus towards producing these great writers, artists, and musicians. 
in cities, right? I'm playing a Russia game that you should definitely check out right now. I literally have every single great person just from building all my lavras in every city. It's insane. It is broken. The problem is you get lavras within the first 10 turns, whereas everybody else is going to get theater squares at like turn 50 or 60. By the time they can build theater squares even on Deity, you are going to have already the first two or three great writers, artists, and musicians. And at that point, it's just too far ahead for you to for them to catch up. And by the time you build theater squares, it's just game over. You're getting every single victory type. I'm going to win a game within 200 turns as Russia for a culture victory. It's just insane. Just remove that. They'll still be massively productive towards a religious victory, and they'll still have bonuses towards a culture victory, just not insanely great for a culture victory. That is all I have for today. This has been a little bit of a longer video than usual. Obviously, I hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Did I tell you guys to subscribe? Because that is something you should definitely be doing. And uh, without further ado, I will see you all in the next video. Peace.